Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our audience uh, on Facebook Live uh, in the United States, in Palestine, and around the world. Um, we are now kicking off uh, Palestine Art Week. It's a week-long celebration of Palestinian artistic excellence. During the week, uh, we're asking everyone to post their favorite uh, works of art, whether it being visual arts, being music, sculpture, embroidery, literary arts, or any other form of arts. Uh, we'd like pe people to post as many of these works on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and elsewhere, they may be social media as well. The idea is to create uh, a storm of Palestinian artwork on the social media and to get everybody around the world to see uh, our artistic excellence. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everybody uh, on this program. And uh, this program is being recorded uh, on Facebook and will be available for later viewing uh, once we're, we complete the program. It would also be posted to our uh, YouTube channel and our website. Uh, at this point, I would like to first uh, introduce uh, the museum staff. Uh, we have Nancy Nesbitt, the head curator at the museum. And we also have uh, Mervat Suwade. She is the director of communications. Um, I'm Faisal Sala, the uh, founder and executive director of the museum. And it gives me a great pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, uh, a number of uh, important people in the art and Palestinian world. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to mention the name of the people first, and then we will do proper introduction as each person's turn comes up, okay? Uh, we have today uh, Samia Halabi. We have Nora Rekat, Fat and Nestas Mitwasi, and also we have uh, Rassan Abu Laban. Rassan is in Amman, Jordan, and Fat is in Bethlehem, Palestine. Samia is in New York, and Nora is in the Washington, D.C. area, I believe. Uh, thank you all. Uh, at this point, I would like to begin by introducing Samia. And um, I did some searches on the web to find out how other people have introduced Samia. And I decided to make an extract of a number of these uh, paragraphs. Um, Samia Halabi is a Palestinian artist and scholar who lives and works in New York. Born in Jerusalem in 1936, she is recognized as one of the Arab world's leading contemporary painters. After nearly 60 years of identifying the essentials of abstract, abstraction, the prolific Sami Halabi is considered to be a trailblazer in contemporary abstract art internationally. And her renowned paintings, which have been co collected by international museums since the 1970s, Halabi draws inspiration from nature and historical movements such as early Islamic architecture and the Soviet avant-garde. Displaced from Palestine in 1948 with her family when she was 11, Halabi was educated in the American Midwest at a time when abstract expressionism was popular but female abstract painters were marginalized. Her work has been exhibited in galleries and museums around the world, such as the Guggenheim Museum of Art, New York and Abu Dhabi, Cleveland Museum of Art, Institut du Monde Arabe, uh, Birzeit University in Ramallah, and the Palestine Museum, US. It gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce Samia Halabi. Samia? Try it now. Okay, thank you so much, Faisal. I'm really pleased to be with you. Uh, and uh, I want to start right away. Uh, it's nice to initiate Palestine Art Week and I hope it becomes really, really strong. It's important. Uh, I start with why I think art history is important. Uh, so much we are told and educated in is Eurocentric. 
And even if we're educated in the Arab world, it's still Eurocentric. Everywhere, it seems that the leading nation, uh, nations, uh, American-centric as well, seem to dominate the history. But I want to remind everybody that nations are a new phenomenon. Uh, and if we say the opposite, the, the um, other side of this Eurocentricity is uh, we are told as artists uh, from anywhere in the world, if we're not European, uh, go to your roots and study your roots and limit yourself to your roots. Don't be ambitious to be part of the mainstream. So with those two things influencing me, history became very important. And I took a careful look at it internationally and liberated myself from this kind of oppression, intellectual oppression that's out there for us. I remember once reading a, a graduate student doctorate paper uh, on Palestinian art, and he, he was Israeli educated, and it, it was to see in his essay something that says, Palestinian fine art didn't start till after Israel was established was a tragedy for me. So we have a great history and if we had the national wherewithal to really develop it and make great books about it, uh, I think it would be really good for our young people. But lacking that, let me go through it very, very quickly to show the, some of the important highlights. Um, can I see the first slide, please? And uh, ancient arts in, in our area, remember there was, a, a, we are also told that there never was a Palestinian nation. You know, before the 18th century, there was no nation period. You know, we were city-states, we were territories, we were feudal lords. Before that, you know, going back to near ancient times, there were slaveholding societies. And, uh, and before that, uh, tribal societies. So uh, nations who are powerful will carve out the whole national history, making it seem like their history went back to the cave, cave times. Uh, so I have researched uh, only the, 19th, the 20th century with great care, publishing to the book Liberation Art of Palestine, which is about the art of the Intifada in the late uh, 20th century. And the other one is a very important chapter in Lina Shayus's book uh, called uh, Jerusalem Interrupt Interrupted. And I wrote a, a, an, a substantial chapter in the book called Pictorial Arts of Jerusalem from 1900 to 1948. Next one, please, Faisal. And so I start uh, to show people uh, the importance of uh, pre pre uh, you know, BC art, and I take you to Nabataean art. Remember the Nabataeans were throughout the area here. And uh, remember Petra, early architectural monuments in Petra are not Roman. Uh, it was when the Romans came in that it began to pollute, if you would, this uh, homegrown art, and it was like a colonizer coming in and influencing. It was very geometric very abstract and very special. Next slide. I'm going fast because we only have 10 minutes each. And here we have something from the fifth century that shows you the predilection for abstraction and for taking shapes. There's also a lot of uh, uh, mosaic in early Christian art that were uh, images of cities, of people, of the crafts. Next slide. Um, and you see the influences coming from Nabataean to the Christian church of the love of geometry, of number, of rhythm. Uh, and next one, and this is a, a church floor. It just, that's all right, stay at this, uh, that uh, uh, was in Syria. And I cover some things in Syria, some in Jordan. Uh, and don't forget that these borders that we're in are not our borders. They're colonialist borders imposed on us. And new borders keep being imposed on us. We are really a population in, in the area. Families across borders, uh, it, it, it is the borders uh, that are imposed by the Sykes-Pico are very artificial. And this is in Jericho, one of the most ancient cities in the world. 
and to remind people of the weight that is in Palestine of our art history. This is Hisham's palace dating from 734 with mosaic floors and the uh, uh, very famous tree with the animals be below it, uh, the hunting scene. Next. And so now I take you to uh, uh, some Quran uh, from the eighth, uh, 800s, ninth century on the left, uh, 1250 on the right to show you the development in, 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 in manuscripts, in uh, the art of geometry, and the art of uh, illumination. And next, please. Uh, when we come to medieval times, early, early medieval times, if you would, uh, I want to show some of the fantastic art that developed the first art of abstraction in the world, really something extremely important. I do not think there is a historian who quite understands how to, to analyze and see uh, is what, is what they call Islamic art and what I call uh, geometric abstraction, uh, uh, Arabic geometric abstraction. First, they we're told we never had painting, but painting is pigments on, on a surface. Images were made of all kinds of materials. Painting is not Im more important than inlaid marble. Uh, we have panels here of geometric formations. We are accused of being just a users of symmetry that is just like wallpaper. But look carefully at these two images. One is a great pylon from the great mosque of Damascus, uh, which was completed in uh, the late, in the early uh, 8th century, 705 to 715. And on the left, uh, right is Al-Aqsa, uh, dating, completed, dating from the seventh century, completed in 692. Look at both of them, how the space is divided, how there are panels. Each is as valuable as any painting made anywhere in the world. Maybe more so. Look at the sensitivity and how to do uh, uh, glass, uh, uh, stained glass against panels uh, that are darker inside. So the kind of aesthetic manipulation of a wall within architecture, the way people are led from place to place in architecture, the way the architecture leads you from uh, dividing space outside as you move into the inside, all are very important aesthetic formal attributes that really need to be uh, more carefully described and deeply respected. Next slide, please. And here I'm showing you a panel that stands by itself uh, in the Dome of the Rock. And it is also, the theme is repeated in Al-Aqsa Mosque. And I put it next to a Mondrian. And to me, there's not a difference between them. Uh, to me, the, the Arab panel is far more exciting. It moves my heart a great deal more deeply and I am very impressed with it, but I do not see why we should not take care of it, think of it as more valuable than a Mondrian painting. Next. And so you see our history is extremely rich. Uh, uh, here are panels from uh, on the left from the Dome of the Rock and on the right from the Great Mosque of Damascus. I'm particularly hypnotized by the pure abstraction of the upper uh, panel where someone just thought a slice of marble was so profoundly beautiful that they put it up there by itself. Next. Did I finish? Yes. <laughs> well, okay. you, fin you finished the slides, but you can keep talking. Do I have time? Uh, we got a couple of minutes, yeah. Okay. Uh, there wasn't... Uh, I guess I failed to add, uh, there's also a great deal more of, uh, 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 to add here that I must have made a mistake and not added to this uh, uh, presentation of uh, uh, the icon. Now the Arab Palestinian icon in specific, we have a whole collection of them from St. Catherine and Mount Sinai. We also have, I also have some uh, reproductions in European manuscripts and books showing Jerusalem painters selling icons to tourists as early as uh, the 9th and 10th century. 
So we've had a tradition of icon painting in Palestine that is quite old, as well as a, 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 an incredible one uh, in, in Aleppo. And so there is that tradition to add to all of the histories that we have to look at. So I think we have a substantial history and art that we should become aware of and we should make the young people very aware of it because it creates confidence. And I'm not saying that we should limit ourselves to that history, freeing ourselves from the kind of uh, negative propaganda about us and about our history means that we become citizens of the world. It means that we know we have a right to learn and we have a right to be influenced by China as much as by Italy, as much as by Egypt. Anything that educates us and opens our brain uh, is especially good for us. That's yes, it. Thank you. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end from the uh, audience on Facebook and from the members of the panel. Uh, Nancy? Mute. Okay, now. Thank you. I'm honored to introduce Nora Erekat. Um, She's an attorney, an advocate for Palestinian rights, stemming from her undergraduate days at Berkeley as a student activist to her position as attorney for the Campaign for Palestinian Rights to the publication of her latest book, Justice for Some, a belief that law is politics and that our political life will change the law, to quote her, has been the focus of her studies and career. She has said, and I quote, art makes us radically dream about our futures advocating for the position of the arts in the struggle for Palestinian and human rights, and also asks, and I quote again, what would an anti-racist struggle look like? In her writings and, read and teaching, she's currently on the faculty of Rutgers University, Erica makes a cogent argument for ending the colonialist position of Palestine and explores what the next position should be. Again, I'm incredibly honored to introduce her, Nora. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So I was, I was just giving my, my great thanks to Nancy and to Faisal and Mirved, and just wanna say I'm, I'm geeking out. It's such an honor to be on a panel with remarkable artists. And you know, for, for full transparency, I'm, I'm a major fan of Ms. Samia Halabi, and so it's great to be here with you virtually. I was supposed to be with you on set in a recent film you were in, which is another form of Palestinian art being produced by Hala uh, Alian. And so I, we missed that opportunity, but it's great to be able to convene with you here and everyone else. I, I feel humbled and out of place because I, my art and my creativity comes through the word and through nonfiction. Um, and so, I, but I do identify as an artist. And the reason I identify as an artist is because I do not believe that it's what you produce as an artist, but instead, what is your sensibility to time and space and the willingness um, and, and the vision to be able to create um, something out of, of, of nothing and to be able to disrupt a linear uh, framework of time and imagine that our current conditions are not actually anything that have historically always been or must remain. And so for that reason, the way that I approach the world is very much through that artistic vision and way. Um, and so if you'll let me identify like that with you, um, I, I very much appreciate it. I think uh, Faisal heard me recently speak on a panel where I was discussing my book and as Nancy highlighted, I do discuss the role of art um, tangentially in the book. Here's why. Um, the, and, and, so here's the beginning and then I'll, I'll go into it. I feel that art does two things. On the one hand, it's very much a part of our resistance. Our, our, our struggle has been one to establish that we exist and so this, this um, refrain that existence is resistance, everything that Samia pointed out historically is a testament that we've always been present. And our erasure 
has been a colonial violence against us to insist that we never were. And so our continuation of the production of art is very much a part of that resistance struggle and also one that's compelling as we narrate our own stories on our own terms. The second piece of it is because I very much believe and I'm committed to the fact that artists are our visionaries. It's not the lawyers or the professors or um, you know the uh, other scholars and, and public intellectuals and such, or the politicians and the policymakers. It's our artists who are dreaming for us possibilities for our radical futures. They are taking they are taking the blank pages to produce images. They are taking screens to produce stories and narratives. They are taking the page to tell us uh, stories, sculpting um, images and allowing us to imagine. It's that permission to break free of uh, what I believe is a, is a prison that politics erects for us because politics is by definition the allocation and the negotiation over scarce resources and how we divide those resources. And that's, that's binding and that's an, a form of entrapment as opposed to a framework where you're approaching this from a blank page as an artist to imagine what could be, what should be um, based on, on this imagination as opposed to being dictated by current circumstances. So how does that relate to the, what Nancy was reading in terms of my book project? In the book I narrate, um, I use the relationship, the complex relationship between law and politics in order to narrate a hundred year history of the Palestinian struggle for freedom between 1917 and 2017, using critical junctures of opportunity that have allowed um, different political players to change the meaning of law to advance their cause. And the takeaway from this story is that Israel has, that the law and international law has um, served Israel far more than it served Palestinians because of their appreciation of the fact that the law is politics. And in order to be able to leverage law, it has to be used in the sophisticated service of a political movement. What is a political movement? That is exactly what we're doing in order to change this balance of power um, that we see in the world and in our lives. At this point, as people ask now, as people ask me now and have asked a lot recently, well, how can Palestinians now use the law either to end the siege on Gaza Pompeo just announced that Israel can do what it likes in regard to the annexation of, of the West Bank. We're, we're at the precipice of, of uh, unabashed annexation. And the question is, well, how do you use law in this moment? And my, re my response has been, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of opportunity to use law right now because our political movement is not as robust as we need it to be. A political movement must feature a tremendous amount of coercive force. And our coercive force, unfortunately, by our Palestinian official leadership has been uh, voluntarily surrendered in order to pursue a politics of acquiescence, in order to demonstrate to Israel and the United States that we are good, that we can govern ourselves, that we can care, take care of Israel and protect it from Palestinians. And so for that reason, that's dictated and informed so much of the Palestinian official strategy which has foregone opportunities to use coercive force um, in the form of direct challenge and legal advocacy of, of pursuing our FIFA, for example, bid to get Israel out of the FIFA League, to pursue the Goldstone Report to hold Israel to account for its first um, onslaught against uh, Gaza in 2008, 2009, to actually pursue um, the statehood bid, with, which the U.S. vetoed in the Security Council, and rather than challenge the U.S. veto in the Security Council, we, we, we accepted the General Assembly um, vote, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, um, the examples are, 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 are too much that basically demonstrate the point I'm trying to say, which is we have, as an official body, foregone these coercive strategies of politics and exchange them for acquiescent strategies to demonstrate that we are eligible for 
um, for, for self-governance. We're trying to prove ourselves, improve our humanity, improve our civilization. We have nothing to prove to anyone. Everyone has something to prove to us for and to, to, to defend the cruelty of the treatment of, of Palestinians, which of course is aligned with the cruelty of treatment towards so many communities who have been deemed disposable. In this moment, what then is coercive force? It need not be military force. Armed resistance is certainly legal and it's moral, but it has not been efficacious precisely because of the political context that we exist in. And so what else can we do and here we have these myriad options available to us that include um, legal challenge, that include political challenge, that include uh, boycott challenges, and, and significantly include and feature our artistic work that has created narratives that are irrefutable, stories um, that are, have, are, are quite formidable. Um, and this ranges from works that are featured in museums to literature that's being produced like from Ibtisam Azim, Isabella Hamad, uh, Susan Abul Hawa. They have written stories that um, Elias Khouri, who have written stories, um, Ghassan Kanafani, who right? I, I, every time I wanted to say something, I remember, you know, I remember someone else. But the point is, is that these stories, are in fact narrating our present and our possible future. Larissa Sansur's work is visionary work. It's sci-fi. It's a bit pessimistic sci-fi, but it's imagining if we continue to pursue this course that Israel and the US have us on, they're going to put Palestinians in a high hotel complex and call it a state, right? In a high rise and call it a state. Um, we have, and that's exactly what Ibtisam Azam does in her work, The Book of Disappearance, which is to imagine if Israel actually allows Palestinians to disappear, how would the world react? How would Israelis react, right? So you begin to imagine these futures. There's artists who have been um, developing for us images of a future Palestine without any borders, which is so liberating from the imposition of these colonial lines, as Samia was alluding to, of the of the forty seven armist uh, of the forty seven partition lines, of the sixty seven um, armistice lines, and now of the peace, you know, the apartheid plan, Bantustan lines that have been given to us. What does Palestine look like without borders, as we imagine ourselves and as part of the Middle East and the rest of the Middle East? And so, um, all that to say is to thank you appreciation for you my 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 appreciation for the arts by the way just as a side note this is wasn't in my bio but i'm one of the co-founders of the dc palestinian film and arts festival and that is one of many festivals around the world but what makes the dc pfaf distinct is that we don't feature stories about palestine we feature palestinian artists whatever stories they're telling us be they you know, stories about their relationships to their mamas or stories about their favorite color or stories about their love relationships. All of that is about recreating also uh, the future of Palestine, which is not a return to 1947, but is actually um, a return to the future yet to be created. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an inspiring speech. Um, I think uh, we're gonna have uh, Mervat now introduce the next speaker. Yes, um, uh, I'm honored to introduce Fatin uh, Nastas Mitwasi. Hello, Sahla, Fatin. Uh, Fatin is an educator, curator, artist, and one of the founder of College of Arts and Culture at Dar Al Kalima University where she's presently head of graphic design and applied arts. Uh, she's daughter of renowned sculptor Fauzi Nastas. Uh, she got her MFA from Jerusalem's uh, Beza, Bezalel, I'm hope, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing this right, Academy of Arts and Design, uh, going on to become arts coordinator at Dar, and Dar and Nadwa Cultural Center. As well as publishing three scholarly books on Palestinian art, she has completed installation projects, including an Emadio Mondi, a commissioned by the Benetton Foundation, all concerned with home identity 
place of fragmentation in the politically unsettled, unsettled environment in Palestine. Fatan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored and very happy to be with you and with uh, also I'm a great fan of uh, Ms. Samia Halabi. And thank you, Nora, for your talk. It is actually very much connected to what I will continue to talk about. Um, actually, uh, I will try to talk about the uh, Palestinian art after the Oslo Accord. But prior to the Oslo Accords, during the 1970s and 1980s, Palestinian artists were under constant threat of detention. And their work was frequently confiscated or damaged by the Israeli military authorities. In this period, artists chose to produce small paintings suitably sized to be hidden in ordinary cars so that they could be smuggled from one place to another. Actually, there were no galleries or museums to exhibit the artworks. Um, uh, actually, we can see the slide, please, uh, Faisal. Uh, coming instead, up. Yeah, so instead of showing artworks in exhibition or museums, the, the artworks uh, were uh, secretly exhibited uh, for a few hours in schools or some social organizations. And uh, sometimes they were reproduced as postcards and posters and were often distributed uh, for certain celebrations, for example, the Mother's Day or the, prisoner, the Prisoner's Day, as we see in this slide, it's posted by Sliman Mansour. Although artists were working under difficult circumstances, however, Palestinian artists had a clear agenda and a superior goal, which was to defend their rights and the rights of their nation, as well as to resist the oppressor and to serve their community. The majority of the visual artists and poets uh, and intellectuals actually consider themselves fighters who utilized art as a creative instrument to foster the Palestinian identity, unite people and direct them to the fields of resistance for the sole purpose of liberation. Uh, please, next slide. However, after the Oslo Accords in September 1993, many of these intellectuals and artists were disappointed and withdrew from the resistance field. After signing an agreement with Israel, there was no need for fighters in the field, as there were no more military orders to resist. A new regime had begun, forging a new era. The Palestinian Authority now represented the people on a portion of the historic land of Palestine. There was no need for artists to hide their art or to produce small paintings, as culture and, and cultural harassment and persecution was no longer an issue. On the contrary, galleries and cultural centers were established and began to flourish. On the other hand, also as a result of Oslo Accord, the historic land of Palestine got divided. New roads occupied the West Bank, checkpoints and high concrete walls separated Palestinian cities and villages. So again, artists found themselves living with new facts on the ground, a new system and a new life that they had to adapt to. I believe that at this stage, and with a free agenda, Palestinian artists and intellectuals started rethinking about their role and they started reconsidering what is art and what art can do. Here we see two artworks by Sliman Mansour. On the right side, we find him taking clay and mud directly from the land of Palestine and using it in his relief titled Shrinking Object. The material plays a vital and direct role in the concept of the work. The map of historic Palestine, like the mud, is shrinking and growing smaller and more fragile. 10 years later, Sliman Mansour drew the artwork on the left, which is titled Homeland. The next slide, please. We are talking here about the same Sliman Mansour who was leading the Palestinian Artists League for many years during the 1970s and 80s. 
and used to produce artworks that encouraged the enthusiasm and ethos of the people to resist like the painting we see at the left side entitled the village wakes up painted in 1987 just before the first intifada started but after oslo we find Sliman mansoor slowly giving up colors reducing his use of symbols to a minimum his art became more conceptual more concentrated and directly connected to the land like we see in the painting to the right side painted last year and is titled Absent Presence 2. If we move uh, to the next slide, then I will talk about uh, actually also after Oslo, many young artists started using new technologies and digital mediums and started using a wide range of media like video art, photography, installation and performance. This work was done by Khalil Rabah he is one of the artists who started doing installation art in Palestine after Oslo. And uh, I, I see that Rabah in his artwork actually challenges the public perception and expectations. He searches into well-established Palestinian symbols, dares to dismantle them into basic elements and represents them in a different way that questions their histories their origins and their impact on our present identity. As we see in this slide, instead of painting embroidery and olive trees, Rabah simply brings embroidery yarns, soak them in olive oil using a usual kitchen tray and install them to confront the barbed wire rolls in the background. Next slide. This is another controversial controversial work of Rabah. It's an installation depicting the iconic image of Jamal al-Mahamid, the porter that was painted by Sliman Mansour in 1973. The original painting of Mansour became an icon of steadfastness, encouraging the people to carry the load of protecting Jerusalem on their backs. However, in the work of Rabah in 2018, the iconic painting is seemingly reproduced while the load of Jerusalem gradually disappears, leaving the visitor of this exhibition with a question about the current situation of Jerusalem, its identity and actually its destiny. Next. Also, in addition to Khalil Rabah, I find the work of Larissa Sansur, the one Nora spoke about, to be very critical and immersed in the current political dialogue. This is the work Nora spoke about. It's titled Nation Estate. It really offers a dystopian yet humorous approach of the deadlock in the Middle East. When Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas approached the UN nation and requested that Palestine be recognized as an independent state, Sansur tried to be optimistic and cynically provided a proposal for how Palestinians can live a high standard living in a national state or a state. With the map on the ground where Israeli settlements continue to grow with the area of the West Bank, can Palestine be recognized as a state? And if so, how and where? Nation Estate is a nine minute science fiction film with a photo series exploring a vertical solution to Palestinian statehood. Palestinians can have a state in the form of a single skyscraper like we see in the poster to the left. Uh, the Nation Estate, she calls it. It's one colossal high rise houses, the entire Palestinian population. Each city has its own floor. Intercity trips, which are in reality interrupted by checkpoints, Sansur suggests that they can be made by electric elevators. Uh, of course, she also uses the Franz Krauss um, poster, uh, which we see on the right side of the slide. Uh, to produce her nation estate. I also believe that after also accord, Palestinian artists 
took a big step in investigating and reflecting their identities. Mahmoud Darwish in 2005 stated that the Palestinian is a human being first before being a cause. The human identity for the Palestinian precedes the national identity. The search for the human identity became a motivation and priority for the Palestinian artists, especially those who were aware of the negative image of the Palestinians in the West and decided to challenge the established stereotype. I, a great work that tackles this issue is the photography installation by Steve Sabella. In his controversial work titled Settlement, Six Israelis, One Palestinian, Steve Sabella confronts his identity in a provocative visual debate, using his own body together with six young Israelis. The next slide, please. All of them are nearly naked, wearing only boxer shorts, photographed with the same pale gray wall as a background. The title of the work sounds very political, and the background reminds us of the wall that is dividing the land on the West Bank. Yet these photos were not taken in Palestine. By portraying himself and six young Israelis naked in the same position and poster, Sabella is highlighting their nakedness and thus vulner vulnerability which ultimately makes the seven young men equal human. The work aims primarily to get rid of the tasteless layers that have coated political art, and by so doing, fundamentally emphasizes the essence of being. Next slide, please. And before I end, I, I would like to share a couple of my own artworks with you. In my work, I search usually into the concepts of home, place, identity, and fragmentation, and uh, the relation between them. In this work, uh, you see here, I refer to the family album photo. Uh, it's me and my mother, you see on the left side. Uh, this photo was taken in 19. 76. Then in 2011, me and my daughter, we restaged the, the photo and took a digital photo. And this is actually to compare the two landscapes and the changes that happened in the Palestinian landscape in less than four decades. Next, please. Next slide, yeah. Uh, this is uh, an artwork I did in 2018. It's a site-specific installation of the sentence Ya Rab Burham in Arabic, which means God have mercy, weaved by barbed wire into fences in various places in Bethlehem and its surrounding. I photographed the installation and exhibited them as photos. In this work, I invite the visitor to contemplate in the Palestinian landscape. The contradiction is seen behind the fence, the dense population areas versus the green land, the old buildings of the native inhabitants versus the colonials of the occupier. One can also contemplate in the prayers that are loudly heard in Palestine, asking God to have mercy on us. But I leave the viewer with the question, how merciful are we to each other? I will end here. I think I, my 10 minutes have ended. Thank you. And I hope uh, I was able to reflect the diversity of the concept and the creativity of the Palestinian artists after Oslo. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Fatin. Uh, but I'll turn it over back to Nancy. Hello. Um, our um, final artist, I have the pleasure of introducing Ghassan um, Ab Abu Laban. Um, Ghassan Abu Laban was born in Bethlehem, Palestine. He earned his BA in Fine Arts at the Yarmouk University in Jordan. 
He currently teaches painting and drawing at the University of Jordan, specializing in portrait and figurative painting. One of the leading artists in Jordan, he has exhibited in more than 15 countries with 24 solo exhibitions and additional biennales and group exhibits, earning three international art awards. In addition to his work, he is a poet and a critic, and his present project comprises an artist's approach toward developing a contemporary theory of aesthetics, um, as well as his excellent figurative painting and portrait painting. He's backed by his latest work, which is much more abstract in nature. At this point, I introduce Ghassan Abu Laban. Thank you very much, Nancy. And uh, it's really a privilege to be among these distinguished persons. And uh, I will be a bit brief because of the short of the time. And uh, I have, I think, uh, a lot of uh, slides to show. And also I will be brief uh, with these slides. But first, let me introduce uh, a bit of introduction about the uh, art scene in, uh, in Jordan. Jordan has been the home of um, millions of refugees since 1967. Uh, among them were tens of artists and uh, later became hundreds of artists. Uh, a few years before that, before 1967, the art was just starting to take its first steps into being a part of the culture scene in Jordan. Though uh, the Palestinian artists such as Hafaf Arafat, Aziz Ammura, Mahmoud Taha, Nasr Abdul Aziz and others had the chance to interact with these Jordanian artists such as uh, Mohanna Durra, Rafiq Laham, and uh, many others. Within a few years later, uh, a very vibrant creative art community was flourishing in Amman. In the capital city of Amman, some of the most exciting and uh, forward-thinking artists uh, supported with education and knowledge they studied in uh, Italy, Russia, France, Germany, uh, Egypt, and uh, several other countries, they struggled to establish themselves in the Jordanian capital. At the beginning, their experiences of exile and displacement was haunting their themes and content of their paintings. They were reflecting on the positioning of Palestinian identity, and the paintings were a, re a representation of waiting, loss, and the current traumatic Palestinian history artists were trying to convey at the beginning. It took a long period of time to form, uh, let's say, uh, um, a more solid and more conceptual in direction and in content that started to speak art more than emotions and more than expressive thoughts. Uh, and not until the 80s that we saw a wide exploration of crucial themes and new presentations of aesthetic uh, interpretations, uh, visual uh, paintings. And uh, they were like pushing forward toward a multiplicity of styles, uh, figurative and uh, non-figurative. We can, uh, if you like, we can start with these slides and we go through the uh, resources and directions uh, in these paintings. Just want to make a quick uh, note here that uh, uh, we will take an extra 10 minutes after the hour to answer some questions since we kind of ran a little bit behind time. We got a late start. Uh, uh, 
Go ahead, Rassan. This is Abdel Hayim Salam. He's uh, now a very old uh, artist. And uh, he's a primitive artist who has his own secret formula of uh, medium of pigment that he uses uh, to do his art. And he is very loyal to the traditional folklore scenes uh, of the Palestinian uh, daily life. Next uh, Sorry. slide, please. Yeah. yeah, coming up. This is Arafat, Afaf Arafat. She was one of the earliest uh, artists to start exhibiting artworks in Jordan. She started back in Palestine for a while and then continued uh, a little bit in, in Amman. And we can see that she's, she's a painter, but also still uh, working on the uh, primitive uh, concept of uh, composition in the painting, limited palette. Uh, and the uh, content is about uh, a scene of regular life in Palestine. Uh, this is uh, Ahmed Nawash. Also, he started very early. Uh, he studied in Italy and uh, the, the art he saw there uh, was part of his education and became part of the uh, composition and the uh, forms he has, but the content itself was more uh, from his memories and, and scenes he used to have and see in Palestine. Uh, since the slides aren't, are not really in order, uh, it goes back and forth in, uh, in time, they're not in line. Uh, this is uh, a contemporary uh, recent uh, artist, Ali Amr. He's a very strong academic artist. And we can see that he uh, uses a very st strong composition, uh, very handy in drawing in figurative and uh, portraits. Uh, he's very good in uh, working uh, on the theme. And uh, he's one of the artists that went beyond the Palestinian uh, subject and he's working his own personal uh, themes. This is one of the uh, very established artists, Aziz Amura, and he's kind of uh, the teacher of uh, generations in the art scene in Jordan. Uh, he's my own teacher and uh, I'm very honored uh, to be one of his students. Uh, recently, he passed away two years ago. Uh, and this, this is uh, uh, a painting that represents his uh, ideas uh, in more contemporary, uh, limited uh, art uh, painting. He uses calligraphy in the background and uh, linear um, artwork. Uh, this is Diana Shamanki. Uh, she lived in Jordan for uh, decades and uh, then she immigrated to the United States. Hanan al Agha, and we can see that uh, the subject itself is more uh, reflecting on the uh, loss uh, and the absence of uh, home, uh, the pigeon, and the reminiscence of uh, the memories about Palestine. Uh, Hosni Abu Qayyim, he's one of the academic uh, academians in, in, uh, in Jordan. He's a very established artist, and this is one of his uh, abstract watercolors. 
Hassan Pantawi, uh, he's uh, uh, a very good artist and he works in um, uh, dividing his painting into small sections, then he uh, interacts these sections with uh, using symbols, uh, using, using uh, motifs and uh, reflections of the um, childhood memories. Jihad al-Amri, he studied in Spain, and we can see the influence of the uh, contemporary art scene in Spain uh, using a multi-layered uh, uh, kind of artwork, uh, figurative and abstract uh, in the same painting. Sorry. This is Muhammad al-Amri, yes. Sorry. Uh, Kamal Abu Halawi. Uh, Kamal Abu Halawi uses also a limited palette, but he uses very varied uh, spaces uh, divided uh, in multi-composition uh, non-linear artwork. Mahmoud Sadiq, uh, he also started early in the late 60s and the 70s, and we can see that he's uh, still loyal to the Palestinian subject with the uh, figures, the symbols, the folklore uh, motifs uh, in the painting. Uh, Muhammad Amri again, and uh, this is acrylic and watercolor. Muhammad Nasrallah is still also one of the uh, artists who uh, keeps uh, adding to the painting, uh, to his painting with more uh, and more symbolized uh, artwork uh, regarding uh, and representing uh, the uh, theme of Palestine. Nabil Shihade, uh, early in his life, he started as uh, an abstract expressionism uh, and he was uh, uh, working along with Mohanna Durra and uh, influenced by the German uh, and European abstraction. Nasr Abdel Aziz, uh, he's a very famous Jordanian Palestinian artist, and he's one of the uh, artists who have uh, distinguished and uh, personal kind of compositions uh, reflecting on the uh, traditional uh, Palestinian uh, women uh, with dresses and backgrounds. Yasser Dweik started also in the 60s and uh, the 70s. He was uh, a colleague to uh, Nasr Abdel Aziz, Mahmoud Taha and uh, Aziz Amura. Also, uh, he's still loyal to the Palestinian uh, subject and the old uh, villages, the old uh, villages scenes and uh, traditional uh, persons uh, from there. Mahmoud Taha, he's a ceramist, uh, one of the leading ceramists in, in Jordan and the Middle East. And this is one of his artwork uh, and he combines uh, ceramic uh, with uh, abstractions from the Islamic uh, geometrical uh, motifs and calligraphy also. Well, Sam, sorry to kind of rush you through the uh, slides at the end. Uh, we, we probably could, could spend a whole session looking at these beautiful uh, paintings. No problem, no problem. Uh, I understand, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn control now over to Merva to see if uh, we have any quick questions we can take uh, for the next uh, several minutes here. Merva? Um, I'm looking through Facebook, actually, we have now over 60 people watching, very positive comments, but uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, I do have a question of, of my own uh, to the panelists. I, you know, looking at this and listening to you, I think the, the power of art essentially is, it's not bound by politics. Artists are free to, to tell the, the Palestinian story, to narrate the Palestinian history, and, like Nora mentioned, to envision a future without any 
political considerations. Uh, how do you all think we can channel this power to take the Palestinian, Palestinian art and use it in a way that serves the Palestinian cause in an effective, effective way? What can we do to take it to the next level? We can, if, if you can all comment on this. Well, Nora, do you want to start? Microphone, sorry. I'm going to cede the floor to the artist. Here's my take really, really quickly. I think that what the artists are doing is, is plenty and more than enough. And it's imperative upon the rest of us to create platforms for them so that these, we, we should elevate these um, pieces of art. We should censor them so that they can be points of controversy. It's about having a week dedicated to uh, this, like the Palestinian Art Week. It's about uh, the art festivals that are centering uh, Palestinian work. It's like the Palestinian, Palestine Music Expo. There's lots of material and there's a lot of room to create platform to distribute and to shine light on that material so as many people as possible can see it, including Palestinians themselves, because this is also about a, a, a self, right? This is also about um, a self-discovery and relationship. Great, great point. Uh, Samia, any additional thoughts? I think we should develop our connections with each other. We should focus, we should uh, celebrate Palestine International we're everywhere and we should be connected. Uh, we should empower our population in Palestine, which outnumbers the other side of the issue here without getting political and naming names. We are in a period of time where there might be a U-turn in the development of history. And I think we should be very, very excited and open and to empower and increase the uh, uh, level of awareness and desire to move forwards of our population, no matter where they are, but particularly in the land of Palestine, all of it, with no exception, it's all ours anyway. And I see it as our right to reclaim it in the future, regardless of the means. So long live Palestine. Great, thank you. Anyone else with any other comments on that question? Yes, uh, if I may. If sure. I um, for me, I think uh, to be good in what I do as an artist, to be a good artist, to uh, work on my art uh, on the terms of the painting, uh, that make me a good representation of where I'm coming from, my identity, and who I am. And uh, so the people could see through the good art that it's coming from Palestine. And as a Palestinian, I would introduce myself as a good artist, not just a Palestinian who makes art and that art could be shaken or not really in, in a good manner visually, but if it's good art and then people could reflect to the, where I'm coming from and the identity that I have. Nancy, do you have any questions? Uh... Um, it's mainly um, a comment and a thanks to you, um, myself, Ella, who is um, allowing a platform for all these artists and all these creative. Um, in the, in the um, case of Nora, you're as much an artist as anyone else on this platform because you're creative, trying to create this world. And that's incredibly important. Now, one of what these artists are doing visually is saying, we are here and we are producing. Um, what art historians are doing, um, a number of which we have on this platform at this time, is saying not only we are here, but we've always been here, but you haven't seen us yet. And what Faisal is doing, absolutely to his credit, is providing a place and a platform for everyone to be noticed and to say, we are here, we have always been here. This is what we're producing. This is how we're trying to change the world. And I thank you immensely for that. Any other ideas from anybody, other comments? We have Samia. Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Samia. 
I, I want to make uh, an idea. Uh, uh, I want to propose an idea to our young people, regardless of what they do, that we should always see ourselves, ourselves and not try to answer or justify ourselves to the propaganda that surrounds us, that makes us drown in it. Uh, I know I'm good. I know I'm excellent. And uh, at the cost of sounding uh, arrogant, uh, I'm not here waiting for their judgment. I am here to inspire the young people to be very active, very busy, and to love and respect each other. That for me is number one. See yourself within your society, respect yourself, and connect with other artists as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, Mervat, you had something to say before we interrupted you. Uh, no, we have a couple of questions from Facebook. Uh, Hen Thuri is asking, uh, could the panelists give us an overview of the commercial value and marketing of Palestinian art? Who? Uh, I can move very, very quickly, then others can follow. Uh, I think our paintings are underpriced in the national market, uh, in the market internationally. And I think that art, we as artists, and all I've said as advice to artists, is completely separate from the commercial art world. They don't know what they're doing. They cannot tell the future. Who among them can tell us what the future in 100 years will consider the great art of our time? They just don't know. It, the stuff, the material is in our hands. We are the artists who make it. And, and we should have the confidence of what we've devoted our life to. Each one of the panelists here have devoted great material to doing what they do. And you should have confidence in yourselves. You're doing good things. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Next, Nervat, next question. A uh, question from Najwa Jardali uh, to Hassan. Uh, she's asking if you teach art history uh, and whether you uh, offer online classes. He's talking about Hassan, not Hassan. Go ahead, Hassan. Uh, sometimes I, I, I teach at the university uh, contemporary art history. Um, and not yet. I haven't considered teaching online, but this is kind of a good idea. And uh, maybe I will. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before we close, one last opportunity. Anybody uh, would like to say anything? Yes, actually, I wanted to uh, comment on the first question uh, by, uh, given by Nancy. I, I uh, always saw art as a powerful tool of communication. And that's why when I do art, at least my own art, I always like to reflect my own ideas, my beliefs and to communicate uh, with the rest of the community. So uh, art is very powerful by itself. And uh, I also agree with uh, uh, Samia, we know what we do. And uh, I also appreciate the diversity of the art production that we are now doing in our contemporary time. Uh, and through the different medium like video art, photography, also artists from Gaza or artists under siege can send out their uh, artworks to the rest of the world. So art is very powerful and with the new technology and the new mediums, we can be even more powerful. And another thing is actually education. I, I also believe in the power of education and I think it's very uh, important that uh, we are doing art education in Palestine, in Jordan, uh, to, to highlight our history. I also believe that we were here uh, thousands of years ago and we are the continuation of uh, uh, development of the art scene on this land. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are most grateful to the uh, four speakers that we've had today and uh, for their inspiring uh, conversation and, and, and quite informative uh, art presentations. Um, I would also uh, like uh, the museum team who participated here and the people behind the scenes, 
uh, our great thanks to the audience that we have on Facebook and to the thousands of people who will be viewing this uh, recording during the next next few days. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, people that they participate heavily in the Palestine Art Week, uh, go to any social media you have and post uh, about your favorite artwork, always with the hashtag, hashtag Palestine Art Week, all one word. And finally, uh, I would like to put a plug in for the Palestine Museum US. Uh, uh, if you liked our programming here and what we're trying to do, uh, please uh, support us. You can go to uh, palestinemuseum.us, our website, and make a donation there if the spirit moves you. And uh, thank you again. We will be doing further programming during the next uh, six days of Art Week. Please stay tuned for our announcements. And thank you so much uh, thank for you. everybody. Thank you, everyone. My admiration, each and every one. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Okay. My salam. My salam. My salam. Bye. I look forward to seeing all your.